to rise every morning colors the sky with the shades of his glory makes us with mercy and love Jesus does who holds the orphan comforts the widow cries for injustice feels every sorrow carries the pain of his children Jesus does so we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son praise to the Spirit who's living He saved me from who I was Cause that's what Jesus does Who understands the heart of the sinner Who showers His grace over all our mistakes Washes us clean his love, Jesus does, oh yes he does, who sings a song of sweet forgiveness, who stole the keys to hell and the grave, who has the power to save, Jesus does. Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus does. Oh, what a friend! Oh. He's always been faithful. He came to my rescue when I needed him most. And he saved my soul. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living.
morning, church. How we doing? Uh oh, I got some theme music today. Glad that you're here. Those of you online, I'm thankful that you're here as well with us today. Um, and this, it's sort of a rainy day today. It's kind of nasty, actually. It'll be like this all day long, supposedly. And that always, by the way, affects church attendance, which means that probably there's a lot more of you watching online today because um, I love you, but you're kind of lazy. And rain kept you from church. I'm just saying. But anyway, um, I really do feel like, which is, is a problem, because this is a key message today as we start a new series. Um, and I firmly believe that over the next four weeks that God is going to change some of your lives in a significant way. And I would love to say all, but that's never the case. I think that um, some people listen, those who have ears to hear, hear, and sometimes we're in spaces where we don't. And so I really do feel like though there'll be some of you that God's going to stir up something in your heart and it's going to change your life. And it's also going to change the world around you, the world that you touch every day, and you won't ever be the same again. And the people around you um, that God calls you to won't ever be the same again either. I really do feel that as we jump into this series today. And so we're going to be studying through the, um, the story of, and therefore the book of, Nehemiah today. Over the next four weeks, we'll be in the Old Testament Nehemiah. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you want to, to chapter 1, right at the beginning of Nehemiah. Or do you turn your phones on and use your Bible app on your phones. By the way, if you don't have... Um, a Bible or you don't like the one you have, we'll give you one on the way out today. No questions asked. Just stop by and grab one. We'll put a free one in your hands. Um, by the way, when we talk about turning to a book like Nehemiah, it's okay to use your table of contents. This is a hard booger to find, all right? On my, my Bible, it's on about page 412 or so, if that helps you, but this is a hard guy to find. Uh, it's kind of sort of hidden in there. If you find Ezra, you'll find Nehemiah. Um, anyway, it's always okay to use your table of contents. I think I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, if you've ever been in church or been around Christians or whatever, and somebody says, turn to this book, and then you, you don't know where you're going, and you get these, like, judgmental stares from somebody. They're like, how dare you not know where it is, right? Um, come on. That's crazy, right? W would it help you to know that when I started studying for this series, I don't know, six months ago, I had to use my table of contents to find Nehemiah? Does that help you a little bit? All right, because it's kind of tucked in there. Anyway, that's where we're going to be. Um, Page 412 in my Bible, if that gets you close, it will get you close, whatever Bible you're using. Um, I want to start off and just make sure that we all understand something really cool that you see demonstrated through this scripture, but it's always been true about God. It's always been true. It's true all throughout scripture, and it's true in our day and lives now, and I just want to make sure that we understand this. Um, those of you in the room that are the best and the brightest, um, those of you that are the coolest, um, the best looking, um, the, the prom kings and queens. I say that because baby girl went to the prom last night for the first time, and I'm, I don't really want to talk about it, so don't ask me about it. I don't know how I feel about it yet, but th those, those cool, good-looking prom kings and queens, I've got good news for you if that's you. God can still use you. Um, he just specializes in using regular, old, everyday, ordinary people. He just does. Look through Scripture and you'll see, and even in, in our Savior's human form, he is in the form that is not, you know, attractive to men and to women, right? It's not attractive. I don't mean that in a sexual way. I mean, he's not good to look at. He's not a good-looking dude. Read through Scripture, you'll see him described that way as well. And so those of you that have got it going on, God can still use you too, but he specializes in using regular, old, everyday, ordinary people. And so when we talk about this guy, Nehemiah, you need to know that he's not a priest, He's not a prophet. He's not a warrior. He was a cup bearer to the king of Persia. Now, a cup bearer's job is to basically drink wine for the king. Now, some of you are going, hey, I like wine. That sounds like a good job. It's not, it's not a good job. It's actually a horrible job. The reason that he would drink this wine for the king or, or bear his cup was so if somebody was going to poison the king, you'd poison the cup bearer first. It's an awful job, right? These people who do this job, they die all the time from doing this job. Like, this is a horrible, horrible job. Um, and he's, he's, just a, he's just a glorified butler. That's all he is. He's a regular old, everyday, glorified butler who heard something that bothered him so deeply that God raised him up to change the world around him in just 52 days, in just a very short period of time. God raised him up to help solve a problem that should have taken years and years and years and years and a lot of people 
to change the world around him in 52 short days. That's, that's the story of Nehemiah, regular old everyday person who God uses in a mighty, mighty way and does something Im, Im, improbable, right? Almost, almost impossible, except for the fact that there is no impossibilities with our God. So let's just jump in, Nehemiah chapter one. We're gonna actually read the whole chapter one, but it's a short chapter. The majority of it's a prayer. Let me just show you verse one. This is a fun verse to read in church, right? When you read verses like this out loud, um, you can thank God that you don't have to do this in front of people, because look at all these words that are hard to explain. So anyway, the, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. All right, what an interesting first verse. Let's just go with it for just a minute. So Kislev, that's not on our calendar, right? You all, none of y'all celebrate Kislev on your calendars. But that is, that is like mid-November-ish through December-ish, mid-December-ish. So basically the time that you and I would be decorating for Christmas, that's the time frame we're talking about on the calendar. And this is 444 B.C. We know through historical context the exact moment that this is happening. So this is 400 or so years before Jesus, right? So they're definitely not decorating for Christmas. And Susa is modern day Iran, all right? So you got it in your head? You know it's like Christmas time, Thanksgiving Christmas time, and it's in modern day Iran is where we're talking about. Look at two through four. Then we'll come back and dissect two through four. There's some really good stuff here. Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. I'll explain all that in a minute. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I, Nehemiah, heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then what comes next is his prayer. We'll read in a few minutes. And so here's the context. The wall or walls of Jerusalem have been down for 140 years. And it's a tremendous embarrassment to the people of God, right? It left them very vulnerable to outside attacks. It made them feel like they were really just had no real homeland, no real space of their own, right? It just, it was a demoralizing thing. The people of God are heavily depressed during this season, and it's like 140 years, right? And so there's really no hope. And, and the whole context of the people of God are like, life's not gonna get better. There's no way to solve this problem. This is just tough. And, that, and they've been kind of walking under that for a very, very long time. And so how does this happen? How do these walls get torn down? Well, in the Old Testament, you'll notice that God is consistently telling his people that if you obey me, I'll bless you, and if you disobey me, there'll be consequences, right? If you follow me, right, I'll bless you. That doesn't mean that bad stuff's not gonna happen, but then if you disobey me, you can guarantee that these things are gonna come down in your life. There's gonna be consequences here, and so um, as their hearts drifted, they started to worship false gods, false idols, as we tend to do, by the way. If we're not, if we're not consistently focused on every single day and as many moments as we can come up with I want to make God I'm going to make sure God's first in my life we will also drift into worshiping idols right ours are just not ones we go by that are cast to look like animals they're just called work and money and relationships and all kinds of things that we make our idols and so their hearts drift away they worship these false gods these false idols the Babylonians come in wipe them out take them into captivity then the Persians come in wipe out the Babylonians and they're a little more relaxed on the Jewish people. So they allow this remnant, which is that word there, remnant meaning a small number, small amount, this remnant of the Jewish people to go back to their homeland to rebuild the temple, of which they do, because it's the temple and the walls and the gates, it's all been wiped out. So they do rebuild the temple, but they ain't very good, and it is not like the temple before. It's sort of like when they look at it, they go, man, this little rinky-dink thing, like this is just, you know, so they got it rebuilt, but it doesn't really, it's not really a, a success. And at the same time, their walls, their gates are still torn down at this moment. And, and, and all of this is going on, this depression amongst all these people, whole group of people, feeling like we're never gonna get back. You know, all our walls are down and when we look at our temple, it looks like they built it with Legos and we just don't like it until one regular old everyday guy has a moment he has what I call a Popeye moment. 
Anybody know Popeye the Sailor Man? Right? Anybody know Popeye? All right. Popeye, if you don't know Popeye the Sailor Man, you're probably young. All right? So let me just lay it out there for you. It's a pretty interesting character. Popeye the Sailor Man was, um, was this sailor cartoon character whose forearms were bigger than his thighs. It was massive. He had these massive forearms, right? And he was kind of goofy. He was kind of a little weird, right? He had this enemy named Brutus. Anybody remember Brutus? And he had this girlfriend named Olive Oil. Let's just be real and honest in church. Olive Oil was ugly. U-G-L-Y, Olive Oil was ugly. Okay? And all the time, Brutus would come in, and Brutus would come to steal olive oil all the time, right? And then every now, like on, on all these episodes, like all of a sudden, Popeye would just have this moment where he grabs his spinach, he squeezes the can of spinach. I don't know why it's canned spinach. He can get no real spinach, but he grabs the can of spinach, and it shoots up in the air, and it falls down into his what? His pipe. And all of a sudden, he's about to go to town. And what he says is, is he says his most famous line, is I've had all eyes can stands and I can't stands no more. I've had all I can take and I can't take no more. And Brutus, I'm about to tear your tail up for my ugly girlfriend, Olive Oil. That's basically what happens in every single episode. Here's, here's what he's saying. Listen to me. What Popeye's saying is, is somebody's got to do something about this and it might as well be me. And that's what happens with Nehemiah here. Like all of a sudden it's, I, I can't stand this no more. And so somebody's got to do something about this problem. And so it might as well be me. Somebody's got to do something. So instead of whining and complaining about it, I'm going to be the one that does something. Look, every now and then there is something that you look at and you say, no, not on my watch. Not while I'm here. I'm not going to tolerate this. I, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and I'm going to say, no, it's not okay and it's not going to happen on my watch. In other words, there's something that you see, you feel the heart of God moves you towards his heart and you look in this world and you go, somebody's got to do something about this problem and it might as well be me. You see, through Nehemiah, what we do is we see the answer to this question. How or, or who does God use to change lives? Who does God use to change lives? See, I think, I think that there's this weird dichotomy in the modern Christian church because of the way we set up things. And maybe we're doing this wrong. Like maybe this idea of you showing up to church and some guy coming out and preaching to you, maybe this is the wrong way. Because I think what it creates is this weird dichotomy of, yes, somebody ought to do something. That ought to be the pastor or the trained people or the church. I can't tell you how many times people will come and go, somebody's got to do something about this. The church needs to do this. And we're like, hey, we're glad you said that because guess what? You are the church, so go do it. I was sitting around waiting for the church to create some official ministry capacity around what needs to be done, right? You are the church. We are the church, so go do something. I think we've created this weird monster where everybody looks towards church and church leadership to fix all the problems in the world when really it takes this Popeye moment for all of us individually to go, God's stirring us on my heart. Somebody's got to do something. It might as well be me. And so God uses people to change lives and it is not the people that you think it's you and by the way it's rarely the prom kings and queens it's rarely the best looking and they got it all together right it's it's god uses some specific people to change lives and i want to tell you who he uses here's number one ordinary people who sit down and who will sit down and cry god will use people to change this world the ordinary people everyday people who will sit down and who will cry look back at verse four the first part of verse four when i heard these things heard about my people the state of the environment that they're in the depression that's there the feeling like they can't do anything when i heard these things i sat down and wept when he, when you see the bible say wept this is not, you know, you got a little tearful in church and you wiped it away before anybody could see it. Dads and gentlemen in the room. This is an ugly cry. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean, an ugly cry? 
where snot comes down, mascara runs, right? You know what I mean? Like, this is ugly cry. I don't know how your family is, but the men in my family, right, young ones and old ones, when we start ugly crying, you're going to know it because we can't stop it. And there's this <laughs> going on. You know what I'm talking about? We can't quit. Now, I cry every single Sunday, by the way, if you've watched this at all. Those of you online, I don't know if you can see it, but it's there every single Sunday. But this is like a, an ugly, sink, like this is a nasty cry. This is snot. This is, he can't even stand up. He's got to sit down and cry. And it's not for himself, but it's for someone else. Most of these ugly cries in your life, these weps, they're heartaches that are not usually tied to just you. They're tied to other people. This is for somebody else. And this is interesting because this is happening a thousand miles away from him. He's a thousand miles away from this. A thousand miles away, it would have been real easy for Nehemiah to do what I've done many times in my life to hear something that doesn't affect me directly, personally, in the moment of my life and say, well, that's too bad. My heart goes out for them, right? We'll pray for you. We'll send some money or write a check, right? I don't know about you, but I have been, and I bet you have too in your life, pretty skillful at ducking pain, pretty skillful at ducking the pain of other people in your life, right? You, you, you see the news where kids are dying of hunger all around the world. And by the way, not all just around the world, in our backyard. And then we can ignore it and go, oh man, that's horrible. What are we having for dinner? Anybody ever done that? The commercial comes on TV. It used to be Sally Struthers on the, on the train tracks, right? Or you know, the, the commercial that comes on and you got Sarah McLaughlin singing in the background. You know what I'm talking about? And the dogs are on there and they're all starving to death. And, and then you, you just kind of pause it or turn the channel and immediately move on to, well, what are we gonna have for dinner? There are a few defining moments in our lives where our heart opens to what God wants to do in this world and community and we say, that, you know what, this is not okay with me. And so I'm gonna push you a little bit to sort of figure out what is that thing that breaks your heart on behalf of the heart of God. What, what's the, the churchy way of saying this over the years has been, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. So what are those things that breaks God's heart? And then also it breaks yours on behalf of the heart of God. You know, I went and asked people on social media about a month ago just to get some prep for this series, just to see what people were thinking, like what breaks your heart. And then I had to include in there no political nonsense, right? Because they would be wasting time talking about presidents, and that's not what I'm getting at. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments of what breaks your heart. And it was addiction, people caught up in addiction, child abuse, elder abuse, child neglect, parents who don't really care for their children, not necessarily abuse, but just those that are kind of checked out, homelessness, hungry kids, hungry people. I mean, the list just went on and on and on. Old people who have nobody to visit them. They're just stuck in some nursing home somewhere. People just forgotten all about them. I mean, it was just on and on and on. Hundreds and hundreds of things. Open up your heart. Don't ignore the burden. What's that thing where you feel like, why doesn't anybody care about this? What's that thing where you're like, why doesn't somebody, why, nobody's paying attention to what's going on with these old people in the nursing home or these kids in our backyards that are hungry or the fact that nobody will stand up and lead the next generation in faith. I don't know what it is, but what is that thing where you're sitting around going, why does nobody, why does nobody else care about this? Why is nobody losing sleep over this like I am? Let me tell you why nobody else is losing sleep over it like you are because God's called you. That's why. The burden's been laid on you. You didn't choose the burden. The burden chose you. It chose you. It's deep down within your soul. And if you'll open up your heart, God can, can indeed turn your, ministry, your, your misery into your ministry. He's a pro at doing this. And if you are sitting here today thinking, I'm just a regular old person, how in the world could I stop and help kids that are hungry in my area i'm just telling you right now it's because god specializes in using ordinary everyday people who will sit down and cry and weep and have their heart broken over what breaks his if your heart's breaking for something 
and you're a regular old everyday person and you know more than 99 percent chance if you attend this church you're a regular old everyday person then you're already halfway there here's a second second people persons that god uses to change lives number two ordinary people who will kneel down and pray ordinary people who will sit down and weep who will sit down and cry and ordinary people who will kneel down and pray look look back what's the first thing he does after he spends significant time weeping it says for some days this is 4b some days i mourned and fasted and prayed before the god of heaven for some days so he sits down and he weeps hearts broken and for some days I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm reaching out, I'm mourning to the God of heaven. The first thing he does with his heartbreak is he prays and seeks the God of heaven. So his heart is breaking for people in this specific situation, and the first thing he does after that heartbreak is he takes that heartbreak to God, and he goes, God, help me with this. I don't know what I'm doing with this, right? He don't just, he don't just throw up a quick little prayer. He's doing this for days. It's probably off and on for days, right? He's not sitting down nonstop for three days. He more than likely is going to bed at night and eating some dinner. But he's praying there, and he's also fasting here. Like he's going, I'm going to throw the whole thing at it. I, I got to know what to do, and so I'm trying to seek God in this moment. What can I do? What can we do? We're just one person. We're just one family. How many of you, you got this thought in your head? You don't have to say it out loud yet, right? Not yet. You got this thought in your head when I was like, what breaks your heart? And you immediately started thinking about hungry kids or whatever, right? And, and, and then real fast, you find yourself going, but who am I? Or what are we? We're just one little family. What can one little family do? Well, you know what you can do? You can pray to the God of heaven and earth. Like you can get on your face before God who you believe is over everything in and through everything and can do whatever he wants. You can actually pray. Some of the most important time you'll ever spend on this earth will be when you seek God in prayer. You know why? Because God plus one is always a majority. Always. Even regular old you. Even messed up you. God plus one is always a majority. And through the power of God, everything he does, everything Nehemiah does is bathed in prayer. Actually, through the entire book, through his entire story, it's all bathed in prayer, everything he does. There's 12 instances of him praying in this very short, action-packed, sort of focused on a task piece of scripture. 12 different instances of him praying. And the whole rest of chapter 1 is this powerful prayer after his heart's being broke and then he goes and he fasts and he prays. The whole rest of chapter one, that's it, is that prayer. Let's read through it. This is five through 11. It completes the entirety of chapter one. So then I say, right, so he's, he weeps, he fasts and prays and he says, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Man, this is a great prayer to start off with. Do you see it right off the bat? God, you're awesome, you're amazing, right? You're a promise keeper, and by the way, I have broken, we have broken, we have sinned against you, right? Like, you're a promise keeper, we are not. And so we repent, sort of setting the stage, the tone. You see how this sets the stage or the tone for prayers? God, let me just, let me just make sure that I let you know that I know that you're awesome and I'm not, right off the bat, Right? He says, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for their name. That's exactly what I was telling you before, right? They, they get off track. They go along, you know, these, these, these sort of things begin to happen. These consequences go down, but he's drawing them back to, but God, you're faithful. And if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. And you don't turn away the repentant. You don't turn away those who say, God, I need you. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by great, your great strength and your mighty hand. 
Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in, in revering your name Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I'll explain this next week. And then look what he says last. I was a cupbearer to the king. That's my favorite line in the entire thing. Because it's this bold prayer of, I, I, somebody's got to do something about this. And I feel like it's going to be me. And he goes, the presence of this great man. He's like, I'm, I'm about to go to my boss. I'm about to go to the king and see if I can figure out how to do something about this and he reminds us right again once at the end and guess who I am I'm just a cup bearer to the king I ain't nobody I'm just a regular old everyday person the, the strongest leaders will be praying leaders not great speakers and orators they're not the perfectly most best organized people in the world they don't have all the perfect looks and got it all together. The best leaders will be praying leaders. The best leaders I've ever worked with, the best leaders in our church, are people who are not just trying to get work done, but realizing that they've got to pray because there's nothing's going to happen without God's involvement in the first place. And so God raises up this great leader who's just a regular old everyday person as a praying leader. And through his prayerful leadership, Something that should have taken years took 52 days. This thing goes by quick in Nehemiah. You know why? Because it only took 52 days. It should be like 40 chapters long, but it doesn't take long at all. See, when God gives you a burden and raises you up as a leader, God can do something significant in this world in a very short period of time. Very short period of time. And this happens all around you. If you're thinking, man, this is just not possible. How does this work? Well, think about anybody you know who's done something significant to, to deal with any of those brokenhearted things in the world, right? They do it in their lifetime, and the most majority of time, they do it within 10 to 20 years in their lifetime, which is a very short amount of time if you think about it. This week, I hope that you will do first and foremost what Nehemiah does, you will open up your heart as it breaks and you will weep and cry for the brokenhearted. You'll transition from let me post about it to let me pray about it. Let, let me post about it to let me post up on my knees about it. Let, let God break my heart for these things and then you get pray you open up to this burden that God has placed on your heart and you begin to pray about it here's the third type of people that God uses to change lives number three ordinary people who will stand up and act there's your prescription to changing the world the world around you to changing lives we change lives how do we change lives you know what we do we we sit down and we cry heart breaks and then we kneel down and we pray. We get on our face before God, and then you know what we do next? We stand up and we act. We stand up and go to work. He cries, he spends significant time in prayer, but he doesn't just only pray. Hear me, I'm telling you that prayer is super important. It is the most important thing that you do all the time, right? It gives you access to holy God. It, it, there's a gazillion things I could give you about prayer, but it can't just stop with you and I being prayer but not doing anything about it. Like we've got to act, and then he acts. He acts, we'll read the scripture next week that what happens is and what he was talking about in that in that prayer is he goes to the king of persia right it's a very intimidating character to go to these persian people are crazy go back and look back then at least he goes to the king now what do you think the king is going to think when he starts bringing up these weird things right because this is the person who he's supposed to be protecting him from getting poisoned but it also is the person who could have poisoned him the easiest, right? You know what I'm talking about? Because he could have very easily been like, let me taste that wine for you, and then not drank it and went, oh, it's good. But it actually been not, right? 
And so all of a sudden he goes to the king and he says, you know, being upset, the king can tell that he's heartbroken and he tells him that he's heartbroken because of the state of the walls and the people. We'll read this next week. The king says, basically, what do you want me to do? And so he throws up another quick prayer and then he says to the king very boldly, hey, send me so I can go rebuild this thing. This is a butler. It's not a builder. He don't know what he's doing. He goes, but king, maybe you'll send me to go build. And he says, you know, what's Nehemiah saying in this moment? I'm not going to send some other people. I'm not going to complain about it or whine about it. I'm not going to just pray about it. I'm not going to sit around and complain, why won't somebody else go do something about this thing, which is what we do most of the time, do we not? We got a whole church, and I don't mean this between us. I mean the American church and our culture. There's a lot of whiners. There's a lot of people who don't want to do anything about these problems, but they want to whine and complain and wait for the city or for the churches to do something about it, right? But see, Nehemiah's going, I'm not going to sit around and just complain and whine. Because God has given me a burden to do something about this, my misery has become my ministry, and so behalf of God, I will declare, not on my watch, not while I'm breathing, he says, somebody's got to do something about this, and it might as well be me. I've had all I can stands, and I can't stands no more. It's time to do something about this. I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but God's given me a burden. I've prayed to him, and now I'm going to stand up and act on it. Some of you, God's going to stir something in you. He already has, I believe, but during this message, during this, this whole next series, and the world around you is going to be different because you're going to get a vision from God and say, I'm not okay with this. This is not right. Somebody's got to do something, and maybe I'm the one that God has said is going to do something in this season, in this community, in my family, in my school, in my workplace. Somebody's got to stand up and do something about it, and it might as well be me. Might as well be me. There's going to be voices inside of you and around you that are going to say, you don't know enough. You're not the one. Somebody does need to do something about it, but there's no way it could be you. It's going to have to be somebody else. And you're going to have to believe and understand that, no, God has called ordinary people to extraordinary tasks in the name of of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he is mighty, and he's constantly doing this through Scripture. He's doing this in everyday life, taking the, taking the ordinary and using them to do something extraordinary, and that can happen with me too. Why? Because me plus God is always a majority. Always. Some of you are going to finally decide, you know, I'm not going to wait on the government. I'm not going to wait on the city. I'm not going to wait on the church. It's going to be me. I get real emotional when I think about 9-11. Um, I remember exactly where I was. This is the defining moment of our generation, right? The American generation. Do you remember where you were? I remember exactly where I was when 9-11 hit. And I don't know if you heard this story, if you even remember it, but there was a 32-year-old guy in a plane, and he finds out that they're flying planes in the buildings, and he finds out that there are people hijacking his plane as he speaks to his family on the phone. His plane is one of them. And so this guy named Todd Beamer who is just an account manager for a software company that's all he is an account manager for a software company does that not scream nerd to you does that scream ultimate fighting championship navy seal you know what that screams nerd regular old guy who's a software account manager says not on my watch they have him recording saying, let's take this thing down. His last words recorded are, let's roll. 
and they take down that plane. The plane goes down, everybody dies on it, but it didn't make its intended target. It didn't even make its backup target. You go read about this, and that, this act with him and several others, it saved countless lives, and it was a regular old person who goes, you know what, not on my watch. This ain't going down without some sort of fight, and we're going to derail this negative plan, right? Broken heart, I'm going to do something about it. You can't tell me this dude didn't pray. And then all of a sudden, the world is different because of it. Listen to me, this burden that you have on your heart, it is on behalf of the heart of God. It's going to get in your spirit, and you're going to look around, and you're going to do, I have to do something. But the need is so very great. The need is huge. I can't do everything, right? There's no way that I could be the one to help feed all these hungry kids just in my neighborhood, much less everywhere else. And you're right. You can't do everything. But you know what you can do? Something. Please, God Almighty, do something. Quit waiting around for me and the church to do it. Please do something. You can't adopt every kid, but you can adopt one. You can't foster every kid, but you can foster one or two. You can't feed every kid, but you can feed a whole lot more than you think you can. Right? You think you can't feed that many people around you? You can feed a whole lot. You can feed 10, 20 kids, no problem. The burden that God placed on my heart a long time ago that I ignored and half ignored, right, as I was in ministry and was for people to be able to come to Jesus and the church not be a barrier to it. I can't get everybody in the Danville community area in Southside. I refuse to call it Sosi. In Southside. I can't, I can't get everybody to come to Jesus. I can't do it. There's no way that we could possibly do it. But you know what we've proven? We've proven with 2,000 salvations and 1,200 baptisms that we can do something. And we can make a difference. A difference and I'm here to tell you that I'm not a prom king I'm a regular old everyday person just like you I put my literal boots on one foot at a time in the morning all right we're regular old people and we have proven I, there's no way I can do something about all of it there's no way but we can do one thing we can make something happen we can make a huge difference God's going to speak to you I'm telling you he's going to if you'll open up and he's gonna break your heart for what breaks his and you're gonna do something and it's going to change you. It's going to change you. It's going to change your focus in life. I'm not just here to make money. I'm not just here to accommodate myself or make my life better, accumulate things, and then die. I'm not just here on this earth to push through work years so I can swing at a, at a little white ball or sit on some beach somewhere collecting shells. That my last act towards the God of the heavens, right, when he comes to get me and say, what did you do with your last act on earth, your retirement period, and I'm going to go hand him some golf balls or some shells? No, you're go it's going to change you, and you're going to realize that God is going to do something mighty, that God has put you here for this reason and purpose, this thing that's breaking your heart, and you're going to do something about it. And this going to work. You're going to make a difference. We're going to have a church full of people who actually care. We're going to get outside of ourselves. We're going to let God take that thing that makes us miserable and turn it into our ministry. And it ain't going to be Union Church's name on it. It's going to be the people of Union Church doing it. I fully believe it. Let me remind you, if you are the best, thank you, sir, you are the best and you are the brightest and you're super good looking and you got it all together and you never lost God can still use you too but right now who he's really speaking to is regular ordinary everyday people who have a burden for him who will actually weep about these things why? Because their heart breaks. Look, when your heart breaks, you can't, you can't help but cry. 
Man, I said this a couple weeks ago, and I'll say it again. Don't, don't let the only time your children see you cry is when your own dad dies. What a tragedy. There are, there are things in this world that are broken. Lots of them. There are hurting people all around you. They look like you. They act like you. They smell like you. They're, they're you. And you can do something about it. God specializes in using ordinary, everyday people. So I want you to think as we begin to close, like what's that burden God's placed on your heart? What are those things that break your heart? What are they? People not knowing Jesus in our community, right? And, and churches getting in the way of that, it breaks my heart. And, and something, had to, something had to give. Somebody had to do something. So why not us? Why not us? So a ragtag, and I mean real ragtag, group of 14 people decided to do something. And a couple thousand salvations later, well, here we are. What's that burden God has placed on your life? I mean, do you just... Do you just get sick on your stomach when you see those people that are homeless panhandling around? When you watch people dying over and over and over again of these horrible drugs and overdoses that are literally, it's, it's literally an epidemic. The real pandemic was the opioid epidemic. And it's only gotten worse. What, what breaks your heart? Kids that don't have dads? Children without homes? Hungry people? Hungry people? I don't, I don't have no idea what it is for you. I'm just telling you that if you will allow God to break your heart for what breaks his, you will get down on your face in prayer and fasting for those things and you will stand up and act. You plus God is a majority. You can do something. No, you cannot do it all. You cannot fix it all. No, 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 you can't. But you can do something and God is masterful in the fact that he'll call you to something like that here and he'll call somebody else to the exact same purpose here and somebody here and somebody here and he begins to create this blanket that begins to fix these issues. You, do not forget, church, I don't have time to get into this and I'm probably past my time right now, but do not forget that we are not in the redemptive phase of humanity. That Humanity has these four phases, right? We have creation and then we have the fall and then we have redemption where Jesus redeems and comes. But that's not the end. We, we're not stuck at saved because after redemption is restoration, when God restores and makes everything brand new and whole and perfect and righteous and holy, right? We are in the restoration phase, right? It's coming. It's coming. But right now, we're post-redemption where God uses us to help restore the broken parts of the world. And one day, he's going to make it absolutely perfect. But you and I are involved in restoration. We get to heal the sick. We get to feed the hungry. We get to make things right and move it towards that moment where God makes everything perfect, righteous, and holy. Jesus returns back and wipes every tear from every eye. There is no more mourning, no more sickness, no more cancer, no more hungry babies, no more abuse, no more drugs, no more addiction, right? But you and I, we get to be a part of that restorative process. Don't just get stuck and saved. It's horrible. The only worst thing horrible you not knowing who Jesus is is you getting stuck at knowing Jesus and you don't walk in him and the, what, the plan that he has for the power that he wants to do in your life that you don't walk with the Holy Spirit 
So I want you to think and pray as we close about that burden. I'm not going to push you too hard. Just ask God to break your heart for what breaks his. And if you don't know Jesus Christ today, wherever you're at, those of you online, you need to understand that you're my burden. You're my burden. I've cried for you. And I want to give you a chance to know who Jesus is today, if that's you, whether you're here in person or online. So if you would, just bow your heads for just a moment. Father God, as we worship you today, as we begin to close and sing, God, and praise you, as we move from this moment of corporate gathering onto what you called for our day today, Father, we humbly, like Nehemiah, repent to you, declare that you are awesome, good, holy, and righteous, and we are not. Lord, let us do exactly what, exactly what Nehemiah did in that prayer. You are a promise-keeping God, and we aren't. And so we humbly bring ourselves before you and ask you to go before us in this. And so right now, Father, Holy Spirit, have your way here and continue to break our hearts for what breaks yours. Lift up their burden to Jesus right now, if that's you. What's that burden? You're going to feel unequipped. You're going to feel like you can't do anything about it. We're going to get to that next week. We're going to talk about what to do after this. But right here in this moment in prayer, lift up that burden. What is it? What is it on your heart? Somebody's got to do something about this. It might as well be me. What is it? Some of you may need to pray about that with some prayer team members today. Our prayer room will be open. The altar is open. Prayer members are there for you to help you figure this out. What is your burden? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, if you've just been attending church or playing church and you've never submitted your life fully over to him, you are my burden. If that's you today, look, it's simple. It's an act of repentance and a declaration of need with your heart and with your mouth. If that's you today, wherever you find yourself, just tell him, Jesus, I need you. You are my Savior and Lord. I believe in you. I trust in you. You love me. You've displayed it on the cross. Tell him, and I love you back. So I submit my life to you. It's free. It's simple. And you will never be the same. Holy Spirit's calling you to give your life over to Jesus today. Do it. Right here, right now. The Holy Spirit's calling you to recommit your life to Jesus right now. Do it. Right here, right now. Tell him you've fallen away, but you repent and you're back. You recommit today for Jesus to be the number one in your life. Tell him. Father, we ask you to draw our hearts open break our hearts for what breaks yours that we will be people who sit down and cry and weep kneel in prayer and fasting and stand up and act I believe you're going to change worlds people's lives in a short period of time through some men and women God of today that are regular, ordinary, everyday people who serve an extraordinary God. I love you and I worship you, God. Jesus, I praise you. Amen.